And so just to be clear, my qualifications for giving this talk are just that um, I recruit people who are interested in building clouds so that we can use them. Um, I don't build them, I just try to use them. And for me, sequencing, so people talk about it as if, you know, drinking out of the fire hose, which doesn't sound appealing to me at all, and I would never try to do that. It's more like in my misspent youth watching all those I Love Lucy reruns. You remember when she was, they were doing the chocolate thing, <laughs> trying out the chocolate. So that, that's what it feels like. At first, it's great, and, and then, oh my gosh, well, okay, it's coming faster and faster, and oh, I'm sick of this. I can't deal with it anymore. What are you guys doing to me? And so, you know, so we have, we have all this data. We're drowning in data. And, and, and everybody, you know, talks about, yes, the $1,000 genome and the $100,000 genome analysis. And, and it's not really that bad. But as Rick pointed out yesterday, it's becoming a higher and higher part, portion of the sequencing costs. The, the analysis costs may come down, the, the processing that, that Daniel was just talking about, but the analysis is still a big deal, and part of that has to do with all of the integration that needs to be done using the beautiful ENCODE data that Stephen was talking about. Um, analysis is still, uh, we're the bottleneck, and we'll be the bottleneck for the foreseeable future. And of course, when you, when you think of the other parts to this, making the data accessible, um, you, you have to have integrated solutions that allow you to do the analyses that need to be done on very large amounts of data. So the variant calls are not nearly as bad as those raw sequencing files, but variant calls for whole genomes on a million people will not be a trivial amount of data. And then, so you need, you need to, to have all that data accessible for analysis. You need to have additional data accessible so that you can do the analysis on the sequence data well. So all of those ENCODE data, thousand genomes data, other kinds of reference data. And then when you, when you want to try to deal with, um, with making it accessible with, with anything related to patient care, there's all these complicated mobiles that we have to deal with. And I'm like Eric, I'm an optimist. I don't think this is any reason to feel um, particularly concerned. The sky's not going to fall. I mean, we used to worry about how we would deal with the deluge of data from GWAS, and you know, that looks like nothing by comparison. And so what I'm going to talk about today is cloud stuff, not as the solution, but as part of a solution. So it's not, um, it's certainly not the be all end all, but it's something that I think um, at the University of Chicago we've thought can be part of the solution that we need to put into place so that our investigators can play in this space in some competitive way. So, so what is cloud computing? And of course, um, there are lots of definitions. Some people say that anything that you do that's out there, so not, on, not directly on your desktop, not on your laptop, that that's cloud computing, and that's, you know, that's a reasonable definition. Some people think of it more in terms of, of what you don't do anymore. You're basically outsourcing your IT support, your, your hardware purchase and maintenance, your software, updates, and so forth. So, and certainly there's, there's aspects of that that I find very attractive. And from the business perspective, it's really a new, a new kind of business model for computing. The idea is that you scale your computing so that you have what you need when you need it, and you pay for that, but then you're not paying for things you're not using all the time, and so, so you don't own what you can't use efficiently all the time. And so, so these are all sort of blind men and the elephant sort of, of ways of looking at cloud computing. And I think of the, the 
keys to cloud computing are also you know, kind of a blind man in the elephant sort of thing, but these are, this is the part of the elephant that I feel. Part of the reason we can, we can really do something with clouds now is a revolution in the virtualization of computing architecture mm -hmm. so that you can, you can deal with security and connectivity almost at the level of the processor as opposed to by the rack. And that means you can expand and contract what users access very quickly and, and, and then serve a community much more effectively. A key part of, of what we think of as cloud computing is, is redundant, abundant data storage, um, relatively inexpensive, um, but of course since since you don't own it, um, you, you pay for it one way or another. And then computational resources to process data are local to the data. Um, another key part of, of what we think of as cloud computing. There's a lot of um, misconception in the scientific community, I think, about the security around clouds, the perception, there is a perception among some scientists that data in clouds are never secure, but you can build a private cloud to any level of security that you need. You can make HIPAA compliant clouds for your electronic medical record data. You can have dbGaP level security for omics research data in clouds. There's no, I mean, you, you, can, you can make private clouds, have whatever security you need to have. Nothing is perfectly secure, but, but that's a given anyway. So you can meet the standards required for, for any level of security within a cloud the same, the same way you can with any particular computer. And of course, there are many public clouds that people use all the time. So certainly Amazon, Google, Dropbox, um, those kinds of public clouds can be very cost effective and very reliable for large scale but short term usage. There are lots of places, for example, that are doing their variant calling in the cloud. So they'll move data up, do their variant calling in the cloud and pull the data back down. And in part, the, for them, the reliability there is an issue. So their current university computing resources are not sufficiently reliable that once they start the variant calling, they can be sure that the computer isn't going to fail, and then they have to start all over again, and, and it's just m more cost effective um, and more reliable to use the clouds, um, in part because of the redundancy that's inherent in those clouds. Amazon. Um, right now is hosting thousand genomes data, other, some other large scale omics data to enable computations to be done in the Amazon cloud for people who want to use that option um, for these kinds of data analyses and, and people are finding it very effective. Amazon's trying to lure people onto this, into this idea by making grants <laughs> available to individuals so you can apply to Amazon um, for $10,000 grants and see how it feels to do your research in the cloud. Um, things that, that might take weeks on your local server or your, the cluster you've put together can be done much more quickly um, on Amazon and you can, it gives you, these grants give you the, the ability to experiment and see how much it costs so that you don't um, get surprised by, by the costs. But um, you, should, you should not not wait too long to get your grant application in because as, you know, once the thousand genomes data and some of these other omics data have migrated to Amazon and people have learned about these grants, um, they've become much more popular and so this is the kind of note that grant applicants are getting now um, on a regular basis. So I'm going to take you through just um, a little bit about the sort of BioNimbus, the, the cloud architecture that's being put together at the University of Chicago. So in the, the Ethernet up there, we've got public clouds. 
Um, there will be, we can hope, scientific commons, and, and those are up there and accessible to investigators to, to access in a variety of ways. Um, you can build HIPAA compliant clouds and, and Bob has done so. So that's Bob Grossman at the University of Chicago. Um, but the main part of the architecture is a more of a research cloud. So, so there's a clinical data warehouse there. There's auxiliary big data, auxiliary big clinical data like imaging um, and so forth. And then this clinical data warehouse converses with a data mart that's much more accessible to investigators. So that, that's all there um, within the structure. There are pipelines for the analysis of sequencing data. So the sequencing cores, individual labs that do sequencing can all feed into the pipelines that they've built for analysis. So that can be variant calling for sequence data, it can be RNA-seq pipelines, so that you end up then with um, omics data that can be stored and, and accessed by people with the right permissions. And then there are pipelines for the analysis of the omics data so that you get results of omics studies of various types, also storable and available to investigators <coughs> that can, of course, talk with other pieces of these data. Um, with a CLIA lab, you have at least a theoretical possibility of the omics data created in a CLIA environment um, feeding into electronic medical records. So you could imagine people being sequenced, the, the sequence data being held in this sort of omics sandbox, but when there are clinically actionable variants detected, those could migrate into the electronic medical record. One of the reasons I've had insurance and law as some of the challenges in dealing with this is that nobody really knows or has tested whether that sort of thing um, would allow a reach through by insurance companies. So you, I mean, we know that insurance companies can access electronic medical records in order to insure patients. They ask you, can we access your medical records? And people, if they want insurance, say yes. Um, so it's one thing for the clinically actionable variants to be here, but does the ability to bring that data over allow insurance companies to reach through to, to things that haven't gone in there yet, that are not considered clinically actionable, but might be of interest to insurance companies? And you'd think not, but nobody really knows. And so, so there's issues around um, law, insurance, that make it hard to know quite um, how to set these things up and use them. In addition to, to these data marks, they've set up what they call drop boxes. So investigators, all BSD faculty, our Biological Sciences Division faculty, all get drop boxes in this space. And the drop boxes can be used just as drop boxes, or they can be used as, as we do more for for storing data that we're going to use in some of these pipelines. So we can go into variant calling with data that we get from sequencing centers. We can go into the analysis pipeline that's already set up, or we can set up our own analysis pipelines, and we, we've done all of that. We can go directly into public clouds for analysis if we want, and if there's a scientific commons, we can do that. And the space is all scalable, so when we're analyzing a bunch of image data with, with a bunch of omics data, we can scale up our workspace to do, to, do, to do this and then scale it back down when we're done. It doesn't mean that, you, there's, that this is all centralized. I still have a cluster, we still have a server room, and, and we still do a lot of work on it, and those computers can, can talk well to this um, cloud and and as, as we always have. A key thing for us is that this cloud contains a lot of public access databases so that when we are doing, when we're developing our pipelines, we can do computes over ENCODE data, we can do computes over 1,000 genomes data. It's all inside the cloud to work with and that speeds things up 
substantially as opposed to going out and fetching things in. And, and it, it come back to what Peter said, you really need this. This is part of the, the statistical genetic analysis of sequence data for common phenotypes is going to revolve a lot on bringing in information on function, iterating back when you discover things, and adding information to about function. So I have to, as I say, um, talk, mention my colleagues, Bob Grossman, who is the one who builds these clouds. Ian Foster is the head of the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago and a very talented computer scientist. And Kevin White is our genomics guy who's pushing a lot of this. So Ian works to develop these pipelines to move big data. So that's one of Ian's big things is developing new ways of moving really big data. And so that, that's, we're, we're being able to take advantage of that to some degree. Bob builds the clouds and, and Kevin's down here trying to push things. Um, and I sit here and, and like to use all of it. Good, thank you Nancy. Questions? I have one question just to start us off is, it seems to me that in entertainment, finance, probably the energy sector, they have much larger data problems, data sets, and data analytic um, challenges than we have. And are, do you think as a community we're doing enough to learn from them? And how do we tap into that and not reinvent the wheel and learn from their mistakes? And so, so you know, that's definitely true. And that, that's sort of the world that Bob comes from. So he's, he's a computer scientist. He, I mean, some of his algorithms are used by credit card companies, so the data mining algorithms, to see when somebody's using credit cards fraudulently. That, I mean, he's, he's worked in some of those areas. And yes, they, they have huge amounts of data. And, and the physical sciences, huge amounts of data are collected, move, you know, they have, have to move it, whether it's geology, atmospheric science. So it's not that these are unique problems to us. Um, it's coming on us very fast, though. So for some of the uh, some other fields, you sort of build up to it more. The, the issue of, of security and, and making your local cloud secure and HIPAA compliant and, and that, um, it, how, how would you define a local cloud? Do you have to have sort of a password to get into it? Or, or how, what makes it local? Well, so, so I mean, I, I, you know. How do you think of dbGaP? I mean, it, so the, the level of security um, around the data stored in dbGaP is comparable to what we have for the main private cloud. The, the HIPAA cloud has additional layers of security. That's why it was shown separately. And then you sort of certify people to have access to the private cloud. That's right. And, and so within, within this space, um, you can you can set up different kinds of access for people. So, you know, it may be that everybody can access omics results. Everybody in the cloud can access omics results. Um, you need special permissions to access the clinical data warehouse. Everybody can query the data mart. You know, how many patients at the University of Chicago have been seen um, in the past two years with Crohn's disease? So that's, you know, that's a simple query. doesn't require any PHI, and you can just do that. In the, anybody can ask that in the data mart. So, so there's, um, yes, definitely different levels of security for different parts. People, different people can get or be denied access to different parts. So is there a difference on who actually owns the hardware in a local cloud? Or in, in the, so Amazon would be a cloud, right? And there are certain policy considerations on the way currently at NIH, whether Amazon, the Amazon cloud is an appropriate storage. That's right. So the private, our private cloud, our University of Chicago cloud, is owned by the University of Chicago, managed by the University of Chicago, run by um, the Bob's IT group, so he's director of clinical research informatics. But in terms of the unlimited capacity for really large projects, a, an Amazon cloud or a Google cloud or whoever provides the service could be an appropriate venue. Right? With appropriate data, yes. Okay. I mean, I think the other issue is how thinking of it, um, taking a step back, what you're going to partition to put into that. I mean, it's 
everything in the world isn't going to go into a cloud. You have to make a decision that you're putting right. the thousand genomes in. Or, for instance, the TCGA, the Cancer Genome Atlas, has established what's called a trusted partnership, which is a new relationship that NIH has with a particular group who are committed to, you know, house, archive, and spin that data, per se, as opposed to dbGaP or NCBI. And there, you know, UCSC, Housewives Group, is can obviously use a, a cloud to be able to hold the TCGA data and the, you know, the requirements for security and, 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 uh, and the veracity and the stability of the data are clearly there. But I think that, you know, as we think about the cloud computing, it's a very early stage of this. And we, you know, many universities are talking about having their own private clouds. Uh, and there are user groups that are talking about creating their own private clouds, even in, in the academic venue of people sharing their data from, you know, non-genetic studies or some of the metabolomics groups are talking about uh, creating these small clouds. So the... Well, that, I mean, yeah. the Mod and Code project, for example, absolutely used a cloud, used this, this sort of architecture for the, the storage and analysis in, for a good part of, of some of the analyses done for modern code, for example. Would, would, would it be a, recommend, a recommendation to consider as an outcome of this meeting, to consider a cloud model? More than a recommendation. So, I don't see sorry. how we could do it without the cloud. <laughs> yeah. It would be hard to imagine sequencing this number of people and phenotypes without a cloud involved. I'm just that's sort of that's where your mind explodes to think of that amount of data without a cloud. Now I come back to Maynard's comment that one person can do a lot of analysis, and that's absolutely right. And with this sort of architecture, that they can do it from an iPad or a phone. I mean, really. Um, I just. Nancy, that was a great presentation, and, and the fact you had on the left, the HIPAA cloud, was terribly important um, to one thing that's kept coming up over and over again, which is the notion of recontacting. So if, if, if there is going to be recontacting as part of this, as we learned through our experience with NHLBI cohorts, you need a whole other informatics um, kind of dimension that has to do with privacy, confidentiality. Um, you know, what's the consent status of the participants in mm -hmm. real time, not, not just um, at any time. So it's, and I th it's what's really good is that you're, you seem to be solving that problem, at least at the University of Chicago, or at least thinking about solving the well, problem. Well, I mean, Bob's taken the, the security issues very seriously. And to date, there hasn't been a lot of research activity in his HIPAA compliant cloud, but it's there, and I mean, there is some use of it. but. Um, it, it's, a it's much more of a pain to use because it is compliant and, and the security issues are more serious. So in the HIPAA compliant, is, is, there, is there any move afoot to try to integrate aspects of the EMR for patients who consent to this? Um, yes. So um, our biobanking effort, so you have the clinical data warehouse, which is basically a mirror of the electronic medical record that's updated sort of on a daily basis. And um, the biobanking effort, which is creating omics data that links to some of those patients. So, so you have the ability with an honest broker sort of system to put omics data together with clinical data. Um, and yeah. Stephen, again, I have one last comment. Um, Nancy, could you speak to a, a sort of a more theoretical question? If you have different clouds that different groups have with slightly different securities, how you would get to the next step of sort of meta-analysis and connections per se? You know, I mean, you're probably only as good as your weakest or your least rigorous security for any given cloud per se. And so, you know, we're new in this, but I, I imagine it's already started down the road. And can you just talk about how clouds connect? Because it may very well be that Harvard, Chicago, Wash U each have their clouds, and somebody wants to put those three together. What is is, is that real easy, or is it not so easy? Well, so, so so some of these have already been linked up with pretty big pipes. Um, so, you know, there some of the sequence. I so I'm sure some of the sequencing centers have that 
capability to NIH, for example. Um, we certainly have some big pipes to Amazon, for example. Um, and, and another point to this is that the pipelines for analysis that you set up in one cloud um, are very easily migrated to, to other clouds, so, which is a big help. So it's not necessarily the case for meta-analysis that you have to migrate the data. You can migrate the pipelines and, and put things together after the fact. My comment is within NIH, are there conversations occurring on confidentiality, data safety criteria in cloud computing, particularly commercial cloud computing? And it seems that this needs to be happening now. Uh, and so we're ready for it when, when the data are coming out. Actually, the gentleman yeah. to your right. Yeah, I mean, uh, I'm on the Senior Oversight Committee, and this, this oh, is... This, no, 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 no. No, and Eric is the chair of it. I mean, this is clearly part of the discussion is this issue of trusted partnerships has mm -hmm. come in place, this mechanism that connects NIH to uh, an outside academic organization that will house, you know, in cloud computing, very important data sets, TCGA, 1,000 genomes and the like. And uh, I think that there's been a very close inspection of that, and we are moving that way. There are some sort of formidable uh, uh, barriers with respect to interpreting some of the very difficult language that we use for the, you know, for patient uh, privacy and pr patient protection. But we are, I, th I think, I could confidently say we're getting to that point that 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 will be tractable. There may be certain requirements, and that's sort of what I was sort of asking Nancy a little bit in the, in the background was sort of levels of security may, you know, the different clouds have may have different impositions of what can and can't be shared, particularly if it's data that's NIH supported because, you know, the current data access policy is that it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Someone gets it from DB Gap and you get it at Chicago and if somebody else has it at Northwestern, each of them have to have it separately before they can put it together because Chicago can't hand the data over to Northwestern. So you can, you can imagine, you can see where th this you know has to be worked out. But I think that there's a lot of effort to try and solve that and because it's it's upon us. That feeds into my underlying question. It seems that this is usually cloaked in patient confidentiality, but often what's driving it is attorneys to of, of legal responsibility. But the NIH is outstanding at pushing the legal responsibility onto the universities and the investigators, and how that's going to, to um, you know, sort of play out if we if we go the route of a commercial cloud and we're hitting a commercial cloud. May, mayhaps I could comment uh, rashly. Um, one of the reasons that, that we insist on having, and, and anyone in the room who knows more about this than me, which is most of you, um, correct me, but one of the reasons we insist on having a one-to-one -one relationship with the universities is, is exactly so we don't force Chicago to be responsible for Northwestern or for Emory or for anyone else. And so, so that is one instance where we actually don't push that on to, to others. But then again, there should be some way that there, there could be sharing without having to go through the entire process process again. Right. But to, so there, there is another issue in terms of cloud computing that probably NIH does need to deal with, and that's the fact that um, private clouds, you could get funded through NIH grants, but appropriate use of public clouds is virtually impossible even when it's the most cost-effective way to do something. So, for example, the last time Farm GKB renewed, had their grant proposal renewed, you know, they, they had, there was some discussion with NIH about going to a cloud computing model, but, you know, they could show it was much more cost effective than, you know, all the IT they had to establish, the hardware, and so forth, and yet there just wasn't a model to do it that way. There just what, it just wasn't possible to fund the enterprise that way. And when we, you know, think about some of these big results databases that people are talking about, um, it may be more effective to, to, to have those um, running in a public cloud. Um, so it's just, it's just something to think about. The, the way NIH does funding might have to, there might have to be some rethinking on, on 
on this, given these new kinds of computing models. All right, thank you everybody for a great um, for a new, new time session. So we have a 15 minute break now, and then we come back and we'll attack the problem of sample selection and participation. Probably also a good time to either eat your potato chips or to clean up the paper.